How did these words from Jesus come off to you just now? Pretty easy? Pretty tough, right? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the people who have 617 laws that they follow ceremoniously, who keep kosher, and who never intermarry with other races or people of other religions, unless your righteousness exceeds them, theirs, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus was saying to the contemporaries of his, the Jewish people, in that time. Tough. This Sermon on the Mount is not easy material. And you are going to have five Sundays of it in a row. So I'm praying for you and all of our preachers during these five weeks as you anxiously and excitedly anticipate the coming of your next pastor. But you know, Scripture is not only law, right? I was at your website a few days ago, and I saw your faith statement. It's a beautiful faith statement. Scripture is both law and gospel. Let's define law and gospel. You already know this, many of you. Law is what God demands, Luther said. Gospel is what God gives freely by grace. Freely meaning we don't have to do anything to earn it. So how do we turn this word of law into a word of law and gospel or law and grace? That's the creative work of the Sermon on the Mount these next weeks. I want to take you back to our first reading today. Those who were fasting, that means that they were staying hungry, like our youth are going to do here in some days or weeks. They would fast, dedicate themselves to repentance for their sins and hearing God's law or God's teaching. That's another word for law, is God's teaching. And they said to God, now remember, they're back in their homeland. They've been in exile in Babylon, and now they're back home, and they're doing all these ceremonies and all this fasting and all of these special days, and they're saying to God, why are we doing this and you aren't hearing us? Why do we do all this? Why do we pray and you don't seem to answer? And God says back to them, that uh, he's going to ask them a few questions. Look, you only fast to quarrel and fight and strike with a wicked fist. Is this the fast that I choose? A day to humble yourself in that way? Is it to bow down your head like a bulrush and lie in sackcloth and ashes? Do you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And so while you're doing this, God says through Isaiah, you oppress your workers, and you hit each other with your fists. It's not this the fast that I choose, to care for those who are poor and needy, to be compassionate, to do justice, to make things right for the powerless people. This is the fast that I am asking you to perform. And when you fast in that way, when not only your heads with a lot of rules are right, but your hearts are right with the love of God, then I'll hear you. You'll call and I'll come quickly. God wants changed hearts, not just changed heads or following rules. So Jesus says in today's gospel, these two texts have been chosen for one another. That unless your righteousness keeps every letter every jot and tittle in the old translation of the law, you cannot hope to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, how about a show of hands? Anybody here who's been perfect? <laughs> Certainly not I. So where do we come out on this? You know, if we just read these words literally, it's very heavy and it's very condemning. So earlier, we encouraged our children, let your light shine. And where does that light come from? Does it come from their own 
own talents? Does it come from their own trying to make their parents and God happy? And we say, no, it comes from Jesus. It comes from his love. And as we grow into adulthood, sometimes we forget this. That it is not our light that is shining. Sometimes we talk about the United States of America as the city set on a hill. A number of our presidents have used that image to describe us. John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Barack Obama. And we get the impression that somehow we make ourselves worthy by working hard, by being ambitious, by using the economic advantages that we have and the diplomatic advantages that we have in the world. We become number one, and then we decide to help other nations because we're this great city set on a hill. I'd like to believe that, but again, we go to law and gospel, and what nation has been perfect, or what nation's people have been perfect. So I want to share a resource with you. This is Evangelical Lutheran Worship. It's our pew book, and we have a copy of this at home, and it's a wonderful devotional aid. So if we're going to have this light, let your light shine, people of Shepherd of the Bay. Let your light shine to fill this place with the praise of God and the service of your community. What will the source of our light be? Will it be us and our trying harder? Will it be us and our ambition? I'm sure with the scholarly pastors that you've had in the past, you know better than that already, right? I can see this, the nodding and the smiling. Okay, so tell me something new, Pastor, today. <coughs> well, I want to share a resource with you reason why we have this light. It's Christ's light in you. In the third article of the Apostles' Creed, Luther writes a meaning. I'll tell you what page it's on. I'm not asking you to turn to it. Some of you may want to, but if you don't, just listen. Page 1162, in the back of our worship is the entire small catechism of Martin Luther, as he named it uh, the Book of the Christian Learning question and answer form, or everything that you ought to know to become a Christian. Well, here's what the third article says. You say it every Sunday, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and so forth. Here's what Luther says is the meaning of that. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. By my own understanding or strength or effort, I cannot believe. I don't have it in me. So who brings this light, this life-giving faith? Instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, through the good news, and lightened me with his gifts. There's where the light comes, from the Holy Spirit. When we were baptized, it began. And through this gospel, he's enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the true faith made me holy. I don't make myself holy. God makes you and me holy when God forgives our sins every Sunday in the confession and forgiveness. God makes us acceptable to God's self. It's God's work. And has kept me in true faith, just as the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, and lightens and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common true faith. Day by day, in this church, the Holy Spirit abundantly forgives all sins, mine and those of all believers. And on the last day will raise me and all the dead and give to us and all believers in Christ <laughs> eternal life. This is most certainly true. So the light is not just our own. It's not just what we're expected to produce. It's, it's not even what we're expected to produce. It comes from God. I want to tell you about a little experience on Friday night at sundown that I had driving back from the scenic overlook here at Ellison Bay back toward Shepherd Park Bay. Just as the sun was setting, I said to Marsha, look, look at the church building. Look at that spire. It was magnificent. It was glorious. How many of you have seen our church spire here at sundown, just as the sun is shining its last light on. If that isn't a city on a hill, I don't know what is. <laughs> this is such a beautiful place. Such a wonderful place for the worship of God. When the sun goes down, that spire goes dark again. 
and I watched the light go up the spire to the top and disappear. And I thought about your spire as I woke up in the middle of the night. Yep, it's dark now. I can use this for my sermon. And again, in the morning, the sun rises, and there it is in its glory. You are the city set on a hill, and so is every worshiping place today. And it is not what you of yourself are able to produce that guarantees the future success of these ministries at Shepherd of the Bay. It's what God is doing in you and through you to others. Another resource in Evangelical Lutheran Worship tells us about that. It's the service of Holy Baptism, where it says, God who is rich in mercy and love gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Christ. And here comes the part of our ministry. We are united with all the baptized in the body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. A number of years ago, when we received new members, we used to use the affirmation of baptism service in this book. I don't know if you've used that here at Shepherd of Faith, where your new members come forward and together you say the Apostles' Creed and then you ask them questions about their intentions in their ministry with you. Let me name those blessings that God gives you. Here's how God gives us light. You have made public profession of your faith. You do it every Sunday. Do you intend to continue in the covenant, the promise that God made with you in holy baptism? Here come the sources of light. To live among God's faithful people. To live among God's faithful people. Not to say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. The nuns, the majority of people in the United States who really have no connection with any religious organization say, I don't have to go to church to be spiritual. I'm spiritual apart from church. And yet, isn't this the source that feeds us, that enlightens us, that forgives us, that heals us? And so we need to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. Part of the reason why I do this leading worship and retirement is because I love so much to be at the altar and to take part in distributing, sharing the bread and the wine, and seeing how people just are transformed by sharing the body and blood of Christ. We're fed, we're nourished for another week of our service. So, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, and you do that in your own unique way. When we are filled with the love and the freedom that is so good for us, we want to share that with others. We don't do it out of obligation. And I must tell you, as someone who has served in a number of congregations, that especially in the in-between times, between one pastor and another, we get this obligation, thank God, this relation, or this, um, this responsibility thing sometimes. We've got to keep it going till the next pastor comes. And when he comes, he's going to take care of everything for us. And we can go back and be relaxed again. Right? Now, I'm not being critical, but I heard someone this morning say as we greeted, well, we're still alive. <laughs> After those many months without a pastor, I'm sure glad we're getting a new one. It's kind of like we can't live without a pastor. I have to tell you, the pastor is not the center of our proclamation. The center of our proclamation is Jesus Christ. He is the constant at Shepherd of the Bay Lutheran. He is the reason why we're here, not the next pastor. Because I will tell you, pastors come and go, and pastors succeed and fail. And sometimes pastors notice us, and sometimes they don't notice us, and then we get this negativity going in. It's not about Pastor. I hope you're getting a wonderful pastor. I know you've had one. We've read about your retired pastor, Foster. He needs to be retired now. And your next pastor feels the call to come and serve Christ with you. You are the city 
set on a hill. You are the light that Christ has given in this place. You together with other congregations of the faithful and with other citizens of Door County and Northern Door shine that light for people whose lives are not always bright, whose lives are sometimes dark, people who are sometimes, like we heard last week in the Beatitudes, the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for things to be right, those who feel put low by the systems or places in which they live and work. So they're the people that Christ lifts up through us sharing this mission together. Let your light shine. It's Christ's light. And it's all of you together. It's not just a pastor and gifted, appointed, and elected leaders. Every one of you is carrying that light into your world today in so many ways we can imagine. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank Christ today for his faithfulness. Let's all let our light shine.